Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. As I listen to the person, it's easier for me to understand the tone that is going to be used, the register, if the person breathes or not. And I actually try to get to know the person in one way or another, because for some reason, I believe that that's how I transfer a little bit of the person into me and I get to be that person and use the person's voice. In this episode of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, I had the opportunity to spend some time with an interpreter from Sao Paulo and Brazil, Cristina. She took us on a magical journey through her family history, her Polish grandmother and her poise as she translated as a secret agent during World War II and the importance of listening deeply and what that meant to the war efforts for the Polish people and the Allied forces was a fascinating insight and something I really wasn't expecting. Christina spends her time as a professional interpreter and translator, which means she's in boardroom situations, she's in meeting rooms, she's in auditoriums and conference centers where she's simultaneously translating from Portuguese to English to Italian and French. She's not doing all four of those languages at the same time. She's good, but she's not that good. And Christina, talks us through some scenarios where she has to dance with the dichotomy between being empathetic to who she's listening to, but also translating and interpreting with no bias and no agenda, which she struggles with. She talks about the fact that fear comes into dialogue and joy comes into dialogue. And yet, as an interpreter, uh, they're only there to interpret the words and how does she do that? She talks us through some really interesting hacks, tips and tricks about how to get about being a great listener. She talks about the role that breathing plays. She talks about the role of being completely available to the conversation and being focused on the content and the person, not yourself. In this episode, I think you'll learn to have great empathy for translators and admire the skill that Christina brings to the conversation. Let's listen in. Deep listening. Akshava amuka. L'écoute profonde. Deep listening. Christina joining us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, thanks for sharing some time with us on the Deep Listening podcast. I'm, I'm curious, and so are the audience, uh, to talk about the difference as you are, between an interpreter and a translator. Hi, Oscar. This is such a pleasure. And thank you for having me for this podcast. Uh, Translators have to work with written documents, whereas interpreters work with oral communication in general, right? So that's the main main difference between both areas. Tell us where you were born and the origins of your family history and Mm -hmm. uh, bring us up to date through that. Well, I was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and um, I come from a very mixed background. My, my mother's family is originally from Poland, and they arrived in Brazil in the early 50s um, after World War II. Uh, and my father's family is from Portugal and Spain, but already in like the fourth or fifth generation in Brazil. And... Um, Basically, I've lived my whole life in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. I did live a few months abroad in Rome. But because my family comes from Europe and specifically from Poland, I was raised in a very multilingual environment. And actually, in my home, we used to speak English and Portuguese all the time. So um, interestingly enough, I was brought up in in a bilingual environment, really. And then I went to an American school my whole life because when my grandmother arrived from Poland, um, she already spoke six or seven languages, I'm not mistaken, if I was not if I'm not mistaken. And she was she started working for my school as a secretary, a librarian, a receptionist, PR. I mean, she took up all sorts of roles that were available at the time. 
And so my mother actually went to the same American school as I did. And then I went to, to that school too. Um, it, after which I studied history and here in Sao Paulo in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, I also have a master's degree in history from the same university. My grandmother played a huge role in my, my life and especially in my raising process. And um, I have one sister, but my parents got divorced when I was quite young. They both remarried. And um, so I grew up with all sorts of stepbrothers and sisters. And so family, family dinners were quite, um, quite packed full, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> but specifically with my mother's family, which has a more of a um, European background, that's when the, the multilingual scenario or intercultural scenario came about with more frequency in the sense that from a very young age, I heard people speaking Polish around me and then studying at an American school, English was also constantly spoken at home. And we were always switching back from one language to the other. And, um, my mom and my grandmother also speak French and speak Italian and other languages. So switching back and forth from one language to the next was very, very common for me and for my family, or even at least uh, just choosing one word or another in one language or another and just resorting to whatever word sounded best for that specific feeling we were trying to, to express at the time, you know? So, um, I mean, to this day, oftentimes I catch myself talking to people and they're just randomly throwing in words in Portuguese or English or French or Italian. And it's like, people are, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> whoa, 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 stop, because not everyone is picking up on what you're saying. <laughs> so, well, we always loved when my grandmother decided to share her stories, um, you know, especially the wartime stories, because, um, so my grandmother, she passed away when she was 96 and to like literally the last second of her life, she was completely lucid, even though she had already broken her hips and she was, I mean, her, her physical body was gone downhill very quickly, unfortunately, but her mind was perfect. And she was always sort of one of those very in control grandmothers, sort of very proper and very sort of, you know, keeping up with everything and everyone, even despite her 95 years. And so growing up with her was amazing because she decided to sort of tell these amazing stories from her times in, in Poland and the war and whatnot. And, um, so, I mean, having, having her as a role model was just a lot to deal with, but in a very positive way, right? Which part of your grandmother do you think you bring to life every day? What qualities do you bring to your work? Well, definitely resourcefulness and definitely um, it, thinking about deep listening. I, uh, I mean, it, for me, it's... It's largely connected to an empathy, right? And my grandmother was a very empathetic person. For me, one of her greatest stories was um, she decided to stay in Poland throughout the war. And her, the rest of her family sort of just fled the country and she decided to stay and join the resistance movements. And because she knew so many languages, um, she was key in helping the allies in this process, especially of getting information across the different areas and in, in Warsaw at the time. So uh, for me, I, I always had this image of this very strong lady and who, despite all hardships and despite the scenario and risking her own life, she tried to do the best that she could, you know, for her for others around her. So empathy and listening to others and trying to get around um, with her language skills always played a key role in her life. So I guess that's what I try to live up to as well. And bringing yourself into your current profession as an interpreter, can you think of a recent scenario where you caught yourself saying, what would my grandmother have done in this situation? Ah, that's interesting. Mm, let me see. As I was thinking of the meaning of, of deep listening and empathy and, and what the roles interpreters should play, um, I was caught thinking about the fact that 
in theory, uh, an interpreter should always be very unbiased and sort of be very proper. For the past few few days, I've been talking to people, completely random people, exactly the opposite, about the opposite, you know, about um, even though I try to preserve the speaker's tone, um, it's really hard to be unbiased. And my, and my grandmother would definitely have tried to be as poised and as proper as possibly, as possible. Um, but for me, that's one of, um, one of the difficulty, difficulties I truly face. This is a real challenge for me, you know, because part of, um, part of what I do has, as far as I'm concerned, is highly connected to um, actually managing to engage with with the speaker and understanding where the person comes from and uh, and connecting in one way or another you know so once I tap into the person's feelings it's it's a hard task for me not to not to really um, sort of be biased or, or or sort of try to remain neutral so and definitely my, I would I would I would get scolded by my grandmother <laughs> Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. What's a typical day in the life of Christina as the interpreter? Firstly, I do work in small meetings in like meeting contexts, you know, in which perhaps, or I don't know, like there's six, eight or eight, six or eight people discussing uh, deals or sort of trying to come to a common point on different matters. I think you're being a bit modest here because you work with investment bankers, you work with lawyers, you work with big technology companies and big brands in in Brazil and all around the world. So, yeah, so these these are these are very important meetings. Lots of pressure for the people in the room, let alone for you. So, how do you do that physically? Physically, you sit in the corner because you have to be as far as you can from everyone else so that people don't feel embarrassed or ashamed because of the fact that you're there. Um, so you have to be as quiet as possible, definitely. Um, I have a small booth, a carry-on kind of soundproof booth that I put in front of me so to isolate the sound. For the people who are actually in the meeting, they, they're sort of disconnected from me as much as they can of course you know because I'm going to still be I'm still going to be there and of course I'll be talking so there will be some sort of volume or some sort of noise in the background but I tried to speak as low as possible so that they don't understand or hear me and because they will be here technically they will be wearing headsets so because they have these headsets on they will be listening to me but um sort of directly into their ears and not as a background noise so there's a lot of pressure um, in general in the corporate scenario. Uh, people don't really want to engage with you as the interpreter. So that's kind of like the, the vibe that I have to send out as well. Um, make myself as scarce as possible. <laughs> and for that process, how do you actually prepare yourself mentally? Well, basically, what do I do before is, um, of course, before the meeting or whatever job it may be, I study whatever material is available, and which generally means presentations, pitches, or just if that, that kind of material is not available, I try to look into and to Google any information I can about the person who's speaking or about the context of the meeting, about the companies involved and whatnot, right? And before I arrive, um, I always try to meditate and do a few vocal exercises, actually. Okay, that's important. So explain how long you would meditate for because breathing's critical in the role of deep thinking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I try to meditate on a daily basis every morning uh, for at least 15 minutes or so, like 15 minutes, half an hour, depending on how much time I have. And for me, it's just a, like it's just one moment that I just sit down in my room and just focus, try to relax and understand the day that is ahead of me and try to picture the day that is ahead of me and the kind of environment I'm going to be in and um, in a way to, to connect with the environment, but not to tap into this energy so much um, as in not to try to be not to be dis distracted by this energy, you know? 
and um, and then I do some vocal exercises, basically to warm up my voice. Let's do one. <laughs> okay, this is general. Mama, mama, mama. Practice the R's and S's and T's because they're the hard ones to get when you're speaking very quickly. So it's just like. Um, uh, S -r, S -r, S -r. I've got, I've got all sorts of them that I do. Yeah, have you, have you ever not practiced? How does that affect your performance? If you no, I, I'm, that's just, uh, I, I can't. Discipline's it's, important. Absolutely. It's key. Um, not only because I want to set my mood, um, also because it's that one moment that I get to sort of really connect to myself and understand what I'm doing there. Um, also for physical reasons, it's, uh, it's my profession is very hard on my throat, right? On my vocal cords. Um, and so definitely that has to be a part of it. It's just like, I mean, it's just like, uh, you don't, you don't start running a half marathon without practicing beforehand. It's the same kind of thing. You know, and you, you have to stretch before you start running on the day of any of any race, right? So it's just it's on a physical level that's super important, but for me it's actually more important on the concentration and on really sort of making myself fully available uh, to the scenario that is about to happen. Beautiful breathing for some people is considered physical for others. It's not. What, what role does breathing play for you to center you, to prepare you for listening and keep you listening? How conscious of your, of your breathing? Breathing is absolutely essential. Um, part of my meditation routine, when I'm in the room actually, when I'm about to start my, my, my interpreting, is to take at least three or four very deep, deep breaths. Um, and I do sort of like the classic meditation uh, routine where it's like um, you inhale for about eight seconds, you hold your breath for another eight, exhale for another eight, and then um, wait another eight seconds to breathe again. Um, and I do that at least three or four times because this is super quick. And it also sort of helps relax, relax my muscles, relax my body, especially because if you're, if you're like, um, if your shoulders are tense or if your neck is tense, that also prevents you from, um, allowing your voice to come out and to channel out more properly too, you know? Um, so definitely breathing is key for me. Um, also what usually happens, and this is where I, I really believe I'm, I'm not really unbiased when I'm interpreting. I really tune into what's going on. Um, I realize how whenever I'm interpreting someone, I pick up on the person's intonation and breathing and end up breathing like the person. And I get really tired. And when I realize I'm getting tired, um, as the person takes a break, I manage to also take a break and take a deep, deep breath and then sort of relax again and actually sort of establish a more um, rhythmic breathing, you know, and throw that into the process. So you've role modeled beautifully what research has proven in 1992 that uh, the deeper you listen, the deeper you breathe, but also the deeper you breathe and synchronize with the speaker, the deeper you're listening. So there's lots of research to prove why you're one of the better, deeper listeners in the world. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Help the audience understand what it sounds like to be in that soundproof booth in Sao Paulo for, for the meeting. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, in your one, if you're in a soundproof booth, um, what happens is there's absolute silence. The only thing you hear in that room, in that booth, in that space, um, are the sounds of your own breath, um, the switches, right? Because you switch your microphone on and off. Um, and eventually for me, I usually take my notes with me into the booth. So, um, I can hear myself sort of shuffling the papers around and that's about it. And what you get is of course I'm wearing a headset too. And so I listen to the speaker directly into my ears, but 
The first image you get when you enter the booth is you shut the door. So that's the first sound, it's a sh sort of the door shutting against you. And then all you have are your own sounds, your own breath, and the speaker whose voice is coming directly into your ears. And it's just about connecting to, 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 that, to that person and to understanding who that person is. And now for the audience, just say what you might have heard recently without divulging anything confidential, but in another language that, so the audience can understand what happens for you. So basically, one of the greatest challenges interpreters have is dealing with uh, jokes and um, bad words, per se, <laughs> uh, because, of course, you have to be um, true to whatever. You, exactly. You have to be unbiased and you have to be true to what you just listened. Right. And um, so I was recently at this conference and one of the girls who it was sort of like there, there were three or four speakers and one of these these very young girls speaking said she was super scared about the challenges ahead of her and that she's she was giving up on all sorts of career related opportunities to focus on a project on social innovation and again this is uh, i was translating as part of a so, uh, youth program for social innovation so if you so, if you don't mind was was, was that in portuguese Yes, that was in Could Portuguese. Could you just say that, what she just said in Portuguese, so the audience can put themselves in your shoes? Surely. Então, recentemente eu participei uh, de um programa de incubação de jovens empreendedores sociais, né? inovadores sociais empreendedores. E eles estavam todos falando sobre o medo, os medos que eles tinham, as dificuldades que eles enfrentam e como é difícil... Uh, superar esses medos e abraçar as ideias que eles têm para si e para o mundo e colocá-las em prática na vida real, né? E como é complicado fazer esse processo. Uh, e um deles justamente disse que a vida é como um sutiã. Você uma hora tem que colocar os peitos nela e ir para frente. I think it's important to pause um, because what I'd love the audience to connect with is what was happening for you while Christina was speaking in a different language, if you speak Portuguese, it would have been simple. So for, for me, I was trying to listen for emotion in the voice. I was listening to pacing in the words and how the language was being connected together because I was trying to get that sense of fear that you were, you were talking about earlier. So when that happens, your strongest language would be Portuguese. Uh, is that fair? I guess so. I guess... Portuguese and English, both of them, because uh, as a child, for me, uh, when I when my parents were talking to me and I first when I first started talking, um, I used to say words in Portuguese and in English at the same time in the same sentences. So, for instance, it was very common for, common for me to say something like "aquela casa," the yellow one, "é minha." So it, it didn't really matter for me. It was were just all it was just all words, um, and I was just throwing them out, you know, randomly. I guess put us then in in your mind where you're going from Portuguese to English or Portuguese to French or Portuguese to Italian. Um, how do you stay present in what's being said and how long is the pause between the time that you hear and then you translate? Take, take our audience through that. Well, for me, establishing initial contact with a speaker before the person effectively speaks is key. And what I do is I always introduce myself in the beginning and I ask the person to introduce him or herself as well and to tell me, to walk me through whatever the person is intent, plans to say and how long are the, is the presentation going to take, if, the, if the, there will be room for questions and answers afterwards and how, in short, just sort of like um, tell me what do they have? Do they have planned? Because I believe that when the speaker does that, um, it's easier for me to understand and pick up on the vibe of how the person's feeling, how the person, if the person is has prepared in advance or not, whether the person um, is planning on using a presentation and just sticking to it, or actually just going with the flow. Um, and also what kind of issues the person is going to approach or not. And also, as I listen to the person, I'm 
it's easier for me to understand the tone that is going to be used, the register, um, if the person breathes or not. And I actually try to get to know the person in one way or another, because for some reason, I believe that that's how I transfer a little bit of the person into me and I get to be that person and use the person's voice and whatnot, right? And, um, and for, interestingly enough, during this conference I was telling you about, which took place in the past 10 days, I was just like there full time with 15 different social entrepreneurs from Brazil, um, each of which had very different, each of whom had very different projects and very different social, cons social issues they were trying to tackle. Um, what I heard from all the people that were listening to my translations and my interpreting was that I actually spoke and, and took, up, took on different intonations and accents and words for each person that was, who was speaking. And that was super interesting for me to hear, you know, because that's, again, coming back to the whole bias issue and uh, being neutral or not, um, as of, because this is such a huge issue for us interpreters, uh, jokes and, and, how, and the words people choose also um, is something we have to pay attention to. And one of the guys actually come, came up to me and as he was talking to this girl um, and saying, sharing their fears and talking about the hardships they have and whatnot, she, she was mentioning how she was super young and she was changing careers and this is what she wanted to do with her life and whatnot. And he comes up to him and said, listen, uh, Brenda, that's her name, Brenda's her name, right? Um, a vida é que nem o sutiã às vezes, tem que enfiar os peitos nela, sabe? And when she translates into English, um, you know what, Brenda? Uh, life is much like a bra. Eventually, you just have to throw your boobs on it, onto it, sort of, or throw your boobs at it, you know, and just get things done. And having to translate that really quickly uh, was also super funny for me because she was, she had the super um, anxious or concerned tone. She was sort of like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? And this guy just sort of said, listen, you just... Put yourself out there. It doesn't really matter. Eventually, you just, you just got to face the, ch the challenges that come your way and period, you know? So it was super funny to, to, to listen to the story. I mean, and to actually have to interpret it in real time. And I actually laughed in the middle of the, <laughs> of the sentence. I could not, not laugh at that, right, as it was going. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Penne ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. For, for people out there, they're looking to improve their listening. That's why they're listening to this podcast. Um, what can they learn from interpreters about listening? You've, you've role modeled beautifully the role of breathing and how important that is. You've role modeled how important it is not to be biased, not to make judgment, to actually listen fully and completely. What, what other tips and tricks do you think people can learn from interpreters to improve their listening? When you're interpreting, there's a there's a difference between listening, understanding, and remembering, right? So for listening, uh, like the technical part of listening, which is when you use your short term memory, right? I've read that if you, ex like if you exercise in for real as in physical exercises, right? If you run or if you do, if you train, uh, do any kind of sports, they will definitely help improve your short term memory. And of course your listening abilities. Um, you can also make crossword puzzles, all sorts of things that will help this technical aspect of listening because as an interpreter is, it is key, um, to not I, I please I quote and unquote when I say this if you were here if you if you could see me you would see me doing the like air quotes you know yeah definitely because um you can't waste time technically listening to things when you're interpreting in other words um you can't be distracted by any noise you can't uh waste your focus or your attention on listening specifically, which is, which sounds really weird as I say it, but it's actually true. I've learned 
by in practice, like actually, as I was doing my job, that my good ear for listening purposes is my right ear. <laughs> so I always have to, if I'm not in a, it would, like if I'm not inside a soundproof booth in a conference room, in an auditorium, whatever, if I'm doing a more uh, like a group translation with, with 30 people or eight people in a room or whatever it may be, um, I have to sit with my right ear turned to the speaker because that for some reason that's the one that listens best <laughs> and when I realize that I'm like okay that's what I have to do here because then I can use all the energy I have to actually um get focus on the person focus on the piece the, the speaker's intonation focus on the breathing focus on the person's body language and everything else right and which means I can actually use my time, attention and energy into understanding what the person is saying, what the person is not saying, the pauses that the person is choosing to make and remembering all that in order to express whatever the person wants to say in this target language. Right. Um, and a lot of doing that has has to do with not being myself. Um, with engaging in, with this person at, at, to such extent that I can actually leave Christina aside and focus on that. So um, that's why I believe meditating for me beforehand is key um, because that's how I get into my flow and then I can easily detach from my daily concerns, my mind, my own thoughts and feelings and can actually listen to that person in a place of empathy, of really putting myself into the person's shoes. And so when I connect to the person on the technical level of listening, um, that doesn't take much of my time, attention and energy, you see, so that I can actually um, sort of preserve the person's tone, preserve the person's energy, preserve the person's breathing um, process. Fantastic. I'm curious, which hand do you write with? My right hand. Your right hand and your right ear. There you yes. go. I mm -hmm. wonder how many in the audience are conscious of which one is their hearing ear. I actually do the same. Uh, it's, it's the same for me, right ear, right hand. Um, but I have a fellow coach who's left-handed and their hearing ear is their left ear. Um, so I think when you're conscious enough about your listening to understand which ear listens the best, you're really deeply listening. One of my favorite questions that I do work with with my clients, Christina, is um, what questions should I've asked today that I haven't? Hmm. <laughs> Actually, um, let me see. Um, I was very interested when you're hearing more about or listening more about the four listening types. <laughs> uh, that was super interesting for me to read. So let's talk about the four listening types. So there's the lost listener, the shrewd listener, the interrupting listener and the dramatic listener. Which one do you struggle with the most? For me, actually, um, it's generally either the shrewd or the dramatic listener because one is focused on the future and whereas the other is, it seems to me to be focused on the past right so one who's anxious to start to see where are you going and the other one who's trying to understand where are you coming from and not even listening to you right um, before you you even get things through but actually what caught the, my attention the most and what made me really start laughing was the interrupting listener and I'll tell you why because a lot of people come up to me at the end of conferences, meetings or whatnot, right? Whenever I finish my, my job and they often say that they were so impressed by how fast I speak and that it's practically real time, but like really real time <laughs> with, uh, with the speaker in the sense that they come up to me and say, it is unbelievable. It's so hard for me to understand. How do you manage to, to sort of speak at the same time. It's almost as if you're guessing uh, what the person is about to say, because with, the, with English and Portuguese specifically, 
Um, adjectives and nouns go in different places, right? It's the other way around. So, for instance, in Portuguese, you generally say the adjectives after the nouns or the adverbs after the, the verbs. And in English, it's obviously the other way around, right? Um, in the sense that it, um, adverbs and adjectives come before verbs and nouns. And so a lot of what I do has in fact, related with trying to foresee what the person is about to say um, for the contest to, to come out and the contents to really be true to what the person's saying, right? And that's all about the where the whole technical aspects of interpreting come about. In other words, studying beforehand, getting to know the person, the brief before the interpreting session and whatnot. But what I always tell people is that, well, I'm glad that you think this is good because in real life, if it's not necessarily so because <laughs> my brain works really fast and I tend to be the interpreter all the time <laughs> to the extent that when I'm talking to people completely outside my professional career and outside of my job and work environment I'm always sort of thinking ahead <laughs> and I'm always sort of like um, foreseeing uh, what people are about to say so in personal relationships that doesn't really work <laughs> so what, what what happens is your profession defines you as a shrewd listener. So you, you have to be a, a good as a shrewd listener. Um, and I'd say personally in personal interactions, you're an interrupting listener. And that's probably an overflow from your um, professional life. Definitely. And that's what I try to work on on a daily basis. Try to de And taking deep breaths all the time, you know, just like breathe, breathe. <laughs> But it was, it was, I mean, it was awesome to, to read about him and the four types. And it was very um, interesting and, and clarifying in a lot of ways. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> so, Christina, thank you so much for your time today. I wish you well. You've been very generous with your time. Your insights are extraordinary. Your skill is amazing. And I'm so delighted I've had an opportunity to listen to you. Um, thank you for everything. Um, Oscar, it's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you for taking an interest in, in, in what I do because it has given me the opportunity to reflect upon um, all these aspects of listening, you know, and especially um, one that has become just so keen to me, which is which is this whole idea of empathetic listening, of, of actually... Um, forgetting yourself and thinking about others more when you're listening to them. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. I'm so jealous of people who can speak more than one language, and I'm particularly envious of Christina. But today we saw amazing examples of the five levels of listening. The first level, listening to yourself. Christina has a disciplined practice around breathing, around meditation, and making sure she's totally available to the conversation. Listening level two, listening to the content, and notice how Christina was saying she was using two parts of her mind to process short-term memory and how words move through and that words weren't necessarily the most important thing in the dialogue. Listening level three is listening for context. And Christina talked about how she prepared to understand the context and introduced herself to the speakers and the content before she even showed up for her work as an interpreter. Listening level number four is listening to what's unsaid and making sure that you allow the speaker the opportunity to fully explore what they haven't said the 125 400 rule says we speak at 125 words a minute, but we can think at up to 400 words a minute. So how do you help the speaker with what's unsaid by asking them what should have asked? As I did today with Christina, I asked her what question I should have asked and she had an amazing light bulb moment. I think you could visualise that light bulb going on in her head as she spoke through it. And then finally is listening for meaning. And as we listen for meaning, you could hear the meaning that Christina's grandmother had in her life and that how important poise was for her and the meaning she brought from that as well. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Deep listening. Deep listening. Whakarongo Pohonu. 
deep listening, impact beyond words.